Okay, so let's continue. Um, now that we've heard about dynamic attributes in general, let's see how we can apply those to moving objects. So uh, that's actually quite straightforward. We just take the coordinates of the object x, y, and maybe also c as dynamic attributes. And for a, a very straightforward function, we just um, model the time times the velocity of the object and that of course gives the travel distance since the uh, last update. This works if you have an object which moves in a straight line, a ship on the ocean, an airplane, um, but if you have something like a car on the, on the road, maybe on a very uh, a curvy road, then that would also require a lot of updates because the, the uh, velocity, the um, the direction vector and maybe also the velocity would change quite a lot. And then again, we have lots of updates to the functions and, uh, oops, sorry, then we have lots of updates which we uh, don't, ac uh, don't actually want. Um, if you have something like a road-based route, then there's another approach where uh, you at another sub attribute, you still have update value and update time like uh, uh, before, but now the value isn't actually the uh, coordinate, but um, it's an index into the root, and the root is then a list of points. Um, we also have a speed, but this now is a scalar, so it gives you how, how many uh, waypoints basically we ca can cover per time unit. And so the uh, the function then is root uh, indexed by the again the update value and the scalar speed um, multiplied by the time difference. Um, now when you have uh, long segments which in which the the root doesn't change a lot. Um, then you go only get one waypoint at the beginning and one waypoint at the end, which of course will then again lead to inaccuracy. So in this case, you might uh, need some additional interpolation um, scheme uh, for these long segments. Okay, so so much for uh, actually how to model moving objects in databases. Now let's briefly look at uh, how to deal with uncertainty and inaccuracy. So position information is of course always inaccurate and um, so one one way to to uh, to describe this would be that an object of course will not always be exactly on the predicted route. That's of course impossible. Um, but if the uh, inaccuracy as indicated here, so this is the predicted route and this is the actual route, if this crosses some uh, uh, threshold regarding the inaccuracy, then we perform an update. We can also have simply a, a specific time interval after which we perform an update anyway, maybe every five minutes. Um, but uh, this tries to strike a balance, this approach between having, again, lots of updates, which we don't want, and having lot of, a lot of inaccuracy if uh, the object moves off in a completely different direction, but the old function is still in the database. Um, and if we look at this now from the query side, then uh, it's, mm, it can't be uh, clear anymore uh, what if the results are actually um, correct or it's, it's uncertain how correct the results are. Um, we already talked about spatial indexes. We already talked about spatial indices. Um, when you have uh, frequent queries for these dynamic attributes, or particularly if you also have range queries over a certain yeah, range, then 
you would need to uh, install some index for this to work uh, efficiently. But um, the spatial indices we talked about earlier, R3 for example, isn't applicable because updates are costly uh, for R3 and we still have a pretty high frequency of updates. So um, how to deal with this? There's actually uh, basically a way to divide this into two sub-problems um, to find a geometric representation of the dynamic attributes. In this case, this means to treat time like an additional space dimension. We'll see in a moment how that looks like. And then we can use the classical spatial indi indexes because, uh, indices, uh, because um, yeah, it's just a then a four-dimensional or maybe three-dimensional space on which we can put our index. So the first uh, version would be a time value representation. So we have uh, all the spatial dimensions we are going to use for our attributes plus time as one more dimension. In the um, example we're going to see next, we have uh, time on the x-axis and uh, the the value, the position in this case on the y-axis. And um, the object itself is a represents the path of movement with uncertainty and a query is actually just a line. Just you, you'll see how that looks like in a moment. Um, so here we have uh, two different moving objects. Again, remember, this is the time and this is the position. And you can, of course, uh, extend that um, to, yeah, to more dimensions if you want at least two dimensional representation, of course, but in general, it means that time is always uh, one axis and sp any spatial di dimensions are the other axis. So here we have two moving objects. Uh, and uh, which are just represented as lines here. Um, and the query is also a line. This query now means basically give me any objects that are at position 75 meters between two and three seconds uh, after zero. So that's the meaning of this query. And of course, only object one intersects that query line. So the result is object one. Um, this means, to recap, that it's uh, very easy to process the, the queries because you just need to calculate line intersection. On the other hand, um, updates are a bit more expensive here. Um, you can also uh, deal with uncertainty here. So if you compare this to the previous slide, then the lines will simply get thicker and the uh, the width of the line now represents the uncertainty. So this object has a very low uncertainty and this one has a very high uncertainty in its position. So it's probably somewhere here in the center, but it's not exactly possible to tell. And this of course now changes the query result. Object one will still fulfill the query every time because it's entirely within the query line or it intersects the entire query line. Um, on the other hand, object 2 might also match the query, but only with a certain uh, probability, which is not very high in this case. Um, so the probability would, in this case, roughly be the ratio of this length towards this length. All right, so now let's look at a different representation. This is the functional representation now. Here we have um, uh, the function as uh, the function now con consists of one dimension and a gradient. And uh, so any dynamic attribute is now a point consisting of dimension and gradient. And this means that the updates can now be quite easy. Uh, on the other hand, the queries are more complex. And I'll show you an example again. So here now, uh, the objects 
since the objects aren't longer represented by absolute position but by velocity um, and starting point basically then uh, the object is just a single point uh, on the other hand the query we saw earlier will now turn into something like this so it's a turns into a complex polygon and of course you can see why the query handling is a lot more uh, complex in this case um, and again here the same moving object as earlier um, is now within the query entirely so it will always match the query and the other one is outside um, how do we deal with uncertainty here um, this simply means that the uh, objects turn into lines now so they're still still very simple to uh, represent. They're just lines uh, representing the range of the inaccuracy. Again, for O1 it's very low, and for O2 it's quite high. And we get the same result also because O1 is enti contained entirely within the query, so it will always match. And O2 only overlaps the query to a very small um, uh, part, so it's very unlikely that it will match. So these are different representations of um, moving objects in a way that you then can actually put a spatial index over the database to be uh, to be able to do efficient searches and, uh, and lookups.